This podcast is brought to you through support from our partner, the Kaliapea Foundation. The Kaliapea Foundation envisions a future grounded in compassion, respect, dignity, reverence for nature, and care for each other and the earth. Other programs supported by Kaliapea include the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and Led to Life. To learn more about Kaliapea's mission, visit kaliapea.org. Welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. How do we make these structures work for all of us? How do we think about structural inclusion and structural belonging? And I'll give you a concrete example. You know, I use this a lot. It's like you build an escalator to get people from one floor to the other. And then someone comes along in a wheelchair. So the system we built doesn't work for that person. And so it looks like that person is asking for something special. But that person is asking for what everyone else was asking for. The resources and support to fully participate in society as a person and as a, a human being to contribute. But what people need to get there and what groups need to get there are going to be different. Today we are speaking with John A. Powell. John is the director of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society and professor of law, African American, and ethnic studies at the University of California, Berkeley. He was previously the executive director at the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at the Ohio State University and the Institute for Race and Poverty at the University of Minnesota. Prior to that, John was the national legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union. He is a co-founder of the Poverty and Race Research Action Council and serves on the board of several national and international organizations. John led the development of an opportunity-based model that connects affordable housing to education, health, healthcare, and employment, and is well known for his work developing the frameworks of targeted universalism and other and belonging to affect equity-based interventions. John has taught at numerous law schools, including Harvard and Columbia University. His latest book is Racing to Justice, Transforming Our Concepts of Self and Other to Build an Inclusive Society. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us today on For the Wild podcast. This is a real treat for so many of us on the team that have been really looking forward to this conversation. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this. So what I've been learning is that much of your work focuses on the acts and practices of othering and belonging. So I'm hoping to ease ourselves into this conversation. You could begin by clarifying the terminology of othering and belonging, and then more specifically, speak to the difference between othering at a personal or individual level versus at the institutional level or through structures of power? Well, thanks for the question. So othering um, is any practice that denies someone their full humanity uh, and their dignity. So it's based on the assumption that either we're better than certain people or certain people are irrelevant. And as extreme, it also suggests some people are dangerous. Um, and so the, when we believe that the other is somehow a threat to our way of life, who we are, our economy, uh, that's an extreme form of othering. And uh, out of that oftentimes come violence. So uh, the thing about othering, which is both interesting and useful, is that it applies across the board. So you're looking at race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, or religion, and, and many others. Um, when you other at an individual level, and all of us have some slight where we go to a party and we're dressed wrong or uh, someone that doesn't like the fact that we're vegetarian or not vegetarian. Those are individual. Um, uh, and you kind of sort of walk away from them in the sense they're transitory. You know, it's like a sting, a taxi driver, Uber driver didn't say hello, right? But when you're it's institutional, it's ongoing and there's a power differential. But when you think about someone slicing me, that's one thing. If someone doesn't give me a loan to buy a house, the implications are much greater. If someone doesn't return my phone call, that's one thing. But if police grab me in the middle of the street, it's quite different. So we live in institutions that most of us uh, don't have that, many, that much contact with other people. But we do have a lot of contact with institutions. And so much of the arrangement of othering in the United States, is, at least until recently, has been through institutions. There's also 
interpersonal. And there's also the intrapersonal, which is that there's at times we other aspects of ourselves. And so there may be a part of myself that I don't acknowledge, or if I do acknowledge, I beat up on it, maybe properly because I'm trying to change. But um, it's a problem when we don't see the full humanity or full life expression across the board. And I oftentimes say the intervention for othering is not saving. So some people go from, well, no, we're all just human beings. We're all human beings. I wouldn't say we're just human beings. Uh, we have uh, much, we're symbolic animals. Uh, we're spiritual animals. We're animals, but we're spiritual and symbolic. And the symbols we organize around are not all the same, and they're important to us. So um, the Jewish tradition just celebrated Seder. Many of us don't know what Seder even means. And so part of belonging and really seeing people requires actually also seeing their differences. And the differences may not be categorical. That is, they're not, they're not born with them and they shift, but we do have differences. And so to really counter othering and embrace belonging, we have to also acknowledge that people have differences. So the creation of the United States and the concept of America or American has historically relied on the process of othering in order to define itself. However, some might point out that this is much more visible in the presence of the current administration. And you've pointed out that globally, ethno-nationalism, for example, is on the rise, which leads me to think about how in the aftermath of Trump's inauguration, many were quick to hone in on economic disenfranchisement as the catalyst for his success. But this conclusion fails to take into account the global rise of many Trump-like figures and ethno-nationalist groups. So I'm wondering if you could speak to this period of global anxiety and perhaps how othering engages with, but also acts separate from economic change. Sure. There are many things that are causing both dislocation in our society and the world today. And there's issues around, certainly there's issues around the economy, but I would argue that broadly speaking, what I call four tracks. One, climate change. Two, technology. Three, globalization. And four, demographics. Could add economics in there, but I don't think it's necessary. These dynamics are happening all over the world. That is globalization, climate change, demographic concern, and um, technology. So when we're exposed to a lot of change, it actually creates uh, anxiety at the biological level. That's true for any mammal. So if you take any mammal and change their environment a lot, it puts stress or anxiety onto their uh, system. And because we're symbolic animals, um, it's, um, we actually live in stories. And so when this anxiety starts happening, we don't know how to react to it until we have a story. And there are two dominant stories. One is what I call a bridging story, one is what I call a breaking story. And a breaking story, and they used to tell by leadership of a, of a movement or a country, someone that people look up to. People can't figure this out all on their own. And so the breaking story is that these changes are threatening, and particularly the change, demographic change, or possible demographic change. And one of the responses is, we're going to stop this change. We're going to stop the demographics. We're going to restore safety. Uh, the world is scary, there's uncertainty. So you literally want authority. You want someone who's authoritative, who can say without questions that things are going to be okay. And um, so that's a lot of what's happening around the world, that the whole world is experiencing globalization, technology, the environment, and concerned about demographics. The whole world is not experiencing economic crisis. In fact, the United States, in some measures, not experiencing economic crisis. It's experiencing inequality crisis, but not economic crisis. Um, the economy, by most measures, is doing quite well, and was doing quite well during the 2016 election. Also, if you look at the data, the people who voted for Trump, and, uh, the white upper, upper middle class, Trump's base was very white, but the white upper middle class voted for him. So it wasn't just uh, you know, high school dropouts of poor people. And it's almost across the board. Uh, white women voted for him, white millennials voted for him, he uh, tapped into deep, profound white anxiety. Uh, and that's not the only anxiety there is, but he tapped into that. Uh, in that white anxiety is also anxiety about 
as just a changing demographics, but people reflectively think of this as a Christian country, and so it's like, well, there are other Muslims. And again, so the breaking story, those people are direct to you. The bridging story would be, yes, the world is changing, uh, technology is changing, but you're going to have a place in it, your life's going to have meaning in it, you're going to be okay. So we bridge with people by listening to their dreams, also by listening to their suffering, and through that, we experience a shared humanity. And um, before Trump, a lot of the breaking was strategic but subliminal. You know, you, so for example, George Bush talked about Willie Horton, or um, Ronald Reagan talked about the welfare queen. Everyone sort of knew they were talking about black people. But what Trump does is he doesn't talk about just people. He talked about those people coming from the border. He's, it's, it's a central part of his thing. He actually attacks Muslims. He surrounds himself with people who have a long history of being explicitly racist, uh, who believe in the hierarchy of beings and believe white people are at the top of the food chain. So yes, he's actually said things that people may have felt a little bit, uh, but instead of offering a world where we share it with others, he's saying, America first. We're taking you back to a past that never was. And this past is implicitly when white people ruled when there weren't many people of color, when there wasn't a Barack Obama. And in a sense, this past never existed. This never was a white country. There were native people here when the uh, Spanish or Columbus landed. So the, the point is, is that these are stories and we live in stories. And, and it's not just reflecting what we're experiencing, it helps shape what we experience and who we are. Thinking about Trump and the specificities of our country and culture, I'm especially attuned to the power of language when it comes to both the act of othering and the rise of fascism. All dictators understand the weight of words in shaping our understanding and perception of reality, or perhaps non-reality. And I think of Hannah Arendt, the political philosopher who also fled Nazi Germany, who wrote The Origins of Totalitarianism, and she wrote, quote, the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the dedicated communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, true and false, no longer exist, end quote. So I'm hoping we could contextualize this quote in terms of collective anxiety and breaking versus bridging. You know, how can bridging and the language of belonging serve as an antidote to what Arendt references. I'm a student of hers as well, and I think she's right in terms, she actually says also one of the first things to die in talk there in governance to truth. And I think it's been well documented that um, Trump lies profusely, he's, he's a habitual liar. It's also interesting that his base essentially doesn't care. I mean, sometimes they've literally interviewed people and they said, you know, they say, well, yeah, we know he lies. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, in a sense, they're looking for a savior. So they're willing to put up with a lot. When you think about how powerful his base is among evangelicals, you know, this is someone who's what, on his third or fourth marriage. He's obviously have credible claims of um, seeing a prostitute while he's married. Uh, you would think that would be that would sink him, but it doesn't. And uh, and people make a lot of excuses like he's been sent by God and God used imperfect vessels and stuff like that. But the, the truth of the matter is, he speaks to their anxiety about race. And part of the antidote is for us who don't believe that the world is organized by hierarchy among people, who don't believe that you can judge someone just by the, the, the shade of their skin, who actually believe in the dignity of all people. It's up to us to not only tell good stories, but to engage and show bridging practices. We need to really think about this at multiple levels. How do we bridge with each other? A couple of short bridges where we actually bridge with people who are who share many of our values and concerns, but yet we may still not be able to work with them. We may still not be able to sort of talk to them. You see this, I mean, there are all kinds of splits. So within the gay community, there's splits sometimes between gays and trans, between the black community, there's sometimes split between America born blacks and, and blacks born outside the United States. So there are all these ways in which we can split. And so bridging doesn't say these splits go away or we all become the same. It says we listen to each other. And I'm not willing to sort of completely condemn you as a human being because you disagree with me on any, any number of things. That I may strongly disagree with some policies, but I also strongly hold on to our, 
our humanity, our ability to care and see each other. And actually, we don't have many practices of that. I mean, it sounds simple. And you can do this at an individual level, but you can also do it at a national level or an international level. You can say to people, um, so for example, in Canada, half immigrants come at about 1% a year, 1% of their population a year are new immigrants. They give them a social pass to ride trains, to go to museums, to expose themselves to cultural features. But part of their swearing in statement is becoming immigrants, not citizens. They give them a health pass so they can go to any hospital in Canada. Those are institutional ways of saying you belong. The, the, the way the police representing the state interact with citizens, do people feel like this is my police or this is somebody else's police? The way we sort of organize money, uh, we literally say to certain groups, either you don't have access to money or it's going to cost you a lot more money to have access to money. When we, you know, up until recently, I you know, think it's someone like Tiger Woods, when we start playing golf, uh, there were a number of golf courses he couldn't go to because blacks weren't allowed. Some of the women aren't allowed. So these are institutional. And we have to sort of address those, but we also have to be willing to bridge, even with people who are on the other side, who are involved with these things. Because again, the two dominant stories uh, in the world today, and that is we need a small we and everybody else is other. And basically we're better than other people and we need to protect ourselves from those other people. Uh, and so we have a small we, and that's what Trump represents America as a small we. And then there's, there's a large we, which recognizes that we're connected not only to each other, but people outside the country. We're connected to the earth. We have a relationship that's not hierarchical, uh, and we need stories about a large we. And so those are the two dominant competing narratives right now, where they have a small we, ethnic nationalism, authoritarian, where they have a, a large we. And the promise of a large degree in the past had been globalization. But globalization, the way it actually developed, became a bank for the elites. The idea, and it showed no respect for the local. So it made some serious mistakes. But it's what one author calls globalization minus, you know, meaning in a sense minus the people. But can we have a different kind of globalization where our structures actually serve people and we still also respect the local? So those are the big challenges, but we haven't resolved which way we're going to go. My guess is for a while we're going to be doing both. So in response to the far right's tactic of stoking the flames of difference as a means to pass policy and legislation, the so-called progressive left almost automatically or maybe even unconsciously reacts by reminding us that we are all the same. But you point out this notion of saming, and you've mentioned it in this conversation so far, can in many ways be just as detrimental or at the very least is not a long-term solution. So how does saming bypass the necessary and transformative practice of bridging? 
Well, it's a very good question. And I think the left is probably traditionally more uh, likely to embrace the idea of saying. And you know, it starts off with the notion of colorblindness, but could be anything, gender blindness, ability blindness. And at least some of it comes from maybe a decent impulse. Like, you know, we shouldn't see, race shouldn't be important. Gender shouldn't be important. But the word is, the operative word shouldn't be because it is important. And we know both at the conscious and unconscious level, uh, most Americans, uh, even quote unquote white Americans who grew up in all white areas, obsessed with race. Think about it at an unconscious level all the time. One of the first things the unconscious does when he meets a person is categorize them by race faster than the conscious can even come online. And it not just categorize, it actually affects our behavior. And so part of the problem, you think about Black Lives Matter, when people say all lives matter. And the answer is, of course, all lives matter, but all lives are not being shot down by the police. As far as I know, in the last several years, there hasn't been one white person who complained they were shot because they were white. We have this notion of hate crime, which says if everybody was the same in every situation, we wouldn't have hate crimes. But when you hurt someone because of their sexual orientation, it's a double hurt. It's the hurt, the physical hurt, and it's also the emotional and psychological hurt. And we can recognize that. And so the charge that we're all the same, while sounding good, actually erases some people. Uh, and erases the needs and the context and the situation of those people. Because when we say we're all the same, the assumption is we're all the same as me, the dominant group. And, and which means I don't have to pay attention to your particularities or your needs, uh, which is a, a sort of a so soft form of bigotry, if you will. Mm -hmm. There has been a resurgence of interest around our understanding of citizenship especially in the last three or four years. And while I'd argue that citizenship has always been contested in this country and certainly manufactured and manipulated at the whims of the political elite in service to the creation of the nation state, I, I, I think that many are for the first time questioning what citizenship should mean as the world experiences climate change, globalization, uh, and even the furthering of technology. And I'm specifically thinking back to something you shared at the Othering and Belonging Conference in Oakland this past month. And you said, quote, we're taking stuff from all over the world, but telling people you have to stay put. We're disrupting systems and climates all over the world and then saying you have to stay put. We're taking oil from the Middle East. We're telling the people in the Middle East, your oil can come, but you can't. We're taking minerals from Africa and saying, we need your minerals to build cell phones, but we don't need your people. We have this global consumption, and at the same time, we're trying to shut the door on people. When the people try to follow their stuff, then they become the problem, end quote. So I'd really love to begin by asking you how you are rethinking citizenship. That's a great question. I mean, you, you know, these the concept of citizenship in really many terms, people have been citizens of countries for a long time, but it's taken on particular meaning only the last couple of hundred years where, because, you know, in ancient England or France, people were subjects and they didn't have much in the way of rights. And the, the Magna Carta was a big step forward in saying, no, people have rights uh, and they should be respected. Um, but when we started this current strategy of, of our experimentation with the nation states. It's only a couple hundred years old, especially with democracy. And there were a whole bunch of assumptions. The assumption in part was that our economies are national and pretty much self-contained. Our environment is national and pretty much self-contained. So the idea of boundedness to some extent made sense, never completely made sense, but it made, to some extent made sense. But as we sort of came further and further into the 19th and 20th century and then 21st century, we started recognizing that not only do people move, but products move, and that's a good thing. I mean, if you think about human beings, I mean, if we didn't move, we'd all still be in, in East Africa. Human beings move, that's, you know, and we move for opportunity. People didn't leave Africa because they wanted to go explore Europe. They left Africa because their conditions changed in terms of food and climate. Uh, people follow opportunity. So all of us have long had a history of moving. What we've done um, in the United States and, and around the world 
is we've actually tried to extract the benefit of movement for things, for the benefit of the elites, but then tell people they can't move. Now we think about it, it's interesting because the European experiment was just the opposite. Or they said things can move, but so can people. So they made their borders more porous. And so we're trying to have it both ways. So we said we want all the technology around the world, we want all the minerals, we want all the stuff, but we don't want the people. That case creates a structural imbalance and a structural inequality. And in some sense, we're denying the fact that for even for people to begin to think about staying, they need their stuff. They need the benefit of this, their stuff. And so we have this argument from economists for you know, much of 100 years saying, it's better when we have open doors, when we trade together. And that may be true, but it's better for whom? Uh, and we can't grow the global economy and not only tell people they can't leave, but also people not reap the benefits of that growth. Um, the last thing I'll say on that is the fear of the other, which is interesting. We can think of colonialism and imperialism as just uh, another expression of what we're talking about now. That is, we go to someone's country, we disrupt their land, we disrupt their culture, we disrupt their identity. What conservatives are worried about now is that people are coming to our country, quote unquote, and they're disrupting our identity, disrupting our land, uh, and, you know, it's, it's the same argument. It's the same as that we don't want to be disrupted. We don't want our identities. No one ever did. <laughs> you know, uh, people in Africa didn't want that. People in Latin America didn't want that. But we've already done it. And we've done it to the benefit of certain countries. Uh, so the concern, to some extent, makes sense that people are feeling anxious about all the change. The solution, though, is not a real solution. The, the dynamics is creating that disability or that dis disequilibrium. It's going to continue even if we were capable of building borders, even if we were capable of building walls. Uh, so part of the thing is we need a new way of thinking about citizenship. Uh, we need a way where there's some parallel between stuff and people. Uh, we need to recognize that we need a way of sharing the earth with all people and with the rest of the earth. And it's not the United States has this corner. I mean, we have bases literally all over the world. Uh, we sort of see the world as our playground. And then as yet, we have these, this idea that, and under Trump at least, uh, America is only for really white Europeans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's this entitlement that comes with the conditioning of being especially a white American, that white Americans should be entitled to have anything they want anywhere in the world and, and not take care of the people or the places, the land, the waters that provide all of these luxury items or creature comforts. So I, I really get chills when I think about that and reading that quote that you had from the conference just last month. It's, it's powerful and very deep. Well, I'd like to transition into a conversation around identity politics and the short-sightedness of those who refuse to engage with the role of identity, specifically the it's not race, it's class argument. I'm wondering how race and class are inextricably linked and how is class a fundamentally racialized creation and how can we engage with this topic in a manner that allows us both to recognize that yes, the neoliberal class is exploiting identity politics, but the momentum building around class is largely a means to address the white working class. That's right. That's right. I mean, that's all right. Um, so we actually, it's interesting because my, from my assessment, Americans don't understand race or class. And the, the effort to move to class oftentimes is an effort to avoid dealing with the concerns and demands of people of color, of trans people, of women. It's basically, no, we're only going to deal with issues that everybody cares about, which is actually not accurate, right? Because people are not situated the same. So we may all care. What is it that we all care about? Is it the environment? No, no, I wasn't talking about the environment. I was talking about the economy. There are obviously things that we all depend on. We depend on the environment. We depend on the economy. We also depend on a certain amount of human dignity and belonging. And so on one hand, the, uh, the assumption that we should only care about the, the economy is oftentimes driven by concerns of white working class is that is if we focus on the issue of black people, the white working class won't like it. If we focus on the issue of uh, marriage equality, the whites 
Christians won't like it. So what we're actually doing is not only saying we're going to set the agenda, which is going to be just the economy. We're also saying we're giving whites, conservative whites, a veto over things that are important to other people. There's a, a Nobel economist named Emeritus Sin. He's, he noted that when you attack people based on a certain axis, that axis become extremely important. So in the 30s, when they're lynching Blacks, it's, it makes it understandable that lynching is going to become a huge issue for Blacks. Now, some whites are saying, well, we're fighting the war, or there's, there's all these other issues, which are important too. But if you're lynching people, that's going to become a salient issue. And it, it should be relatively easy for liberal or progressive whites to say, yes, we have to pay attention to how other people are being excluded and otherized, whether it's through rape, whether it's through sexual touching, whether it's through police brutality, whether it's through uh, children being locked up at the border, uh, whether it's through pipelines going through people's country. So you can't tell people who are literally fighting life and death things to keep those things in abeyance while we deal with the big issue. That, that's just wrong. I mean, so when people make comments about identity politics, like I said, we can engage in identity politics, what's called identity politics, in a way that's destructive, but that's actually when they turn to breaking politics. When one is, uh, I'm not saying you, my issues are important, your issues are not important. Um, those are breaking politics. Uh, but to say, your issues are important, and so are mine, that's not breaking. Uh, so yes, I don't worry about uh, being accosted on the streets at night, but most of my women friends do. For me to say, that's not an issue because it's not an issue for me. You know, I don't really worry about being homeless, but I know thousands of people in the United States are homeless. So do I say, I mean, part of it is kind of a, a group-based egotism. I only care about what affects me directly. And that's all you should care about too. Um, and I hope that the Democratic Party, in essence, have matured enough because frankly, it's running away from race was not simply saying the economy is most important. When it started doing that, when they saw how the Republicans were effectively using race. So it'd be one thing if race or some positions weren't on the table, but they're on the table, but it's only being used by one side. The other side, Democrats largely, have been afraid. It's like, no, we can't talk about that. They can talk about it. They are talking about it. But if we talk about it, we'll get blasted by our white base. And that says you haven't developed your white base well. You should, and increasingly, um, shouldn't feel threatened because people of color are doing better. Uh, it's not a zero-sum game. And part of it is to make that story clear. We're not talking about helping Latinos and not helping Blacks, helping Blacks but not helping Native Americans, helping men but not helping women. We're talking about everybody. And that's the story we need to be talking about. But everybody recognizing people need different things. So not everybody's gonna do one thing because one thing is not gonna affect everybody in a, in a positive way. So we have to be much more attentive as to how people are situated. Uh, and I refer to that as targeting universalism. I have so many questions based off that response. And I don't really know how to frame it right now because I do see the complexity that everybody's problems needs to be heard because they're all different. I It's hard to say that there is a hierarchy of issues, but I think probably there is, but who gets to decide that? Then again, we're like mired in these complications of dominance and and then and then I feel like we kind of swirl into this crash this crashing moment of well how do we even start or or where do we even begin to look at all these issues at once and who's deciding which which issues are prioritized and you know you you don't have to answer that question because it's not really a well formed one but I definitely feel a great question <laughs> yeah no, I'm serious you know I mean and I think part of it is you don't prioritize but here, here's the thing, people who are most marginal, we have to make sure their stories are centered. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure they're practice centered. So when you have a meeting, for example, oftentimes I live in Berkeley, oftentimes if you're middle class myself, it's easy for me to get there. But a lot of people, they can't get off work. They don't have a car if they do mm -hmm. get off work. So it's like, just have a meeting is not making it accessible. What do I need to do to make things accessible, to make it meaningful for all groups? And we have the concept that comes from belonging as Belonging, which is different than inclusion, belonging is about co-creating the thing you're joining. Mm. So yes, some groups have a history of actually having a big voice. We're not saying we don't tend to be 
silent. We want the voice to step back and let other voices come forward. And so we live in structures and, and how do we make these structures work for all of us? How do we think about structural inclusion and structural belonging? And I'll give you a concrete example. You know, I use this a lot. It's like we build an um, escalator to get people from one floor to the other. And then someone comes along in a wheelchair. So the system we built doesn't work for that person. And so it looks like that person is asking for something special, but that person is asking for what everyone else was asking for, the resources and support to fully participate in society as a person and as a, a human being to contribute. But what people need to get there and what groups need to get there are going to be different. And so there's not an absolute priority, but there is recognizing that some people are more on the edge than others. And in some, in some ways, it's not even issues. It is issues, but it really starts with respecting our human dignity. Once mm -hmm. we really respect and care about people, then they'll tell them what they need. And, and you know, but if I'm saying those people don't count or those people aren't visible, that becomes a priority. When we change the structure, oftentimes, if we change from the most marginal, everybody else benefits. Mm -hmm. Think of uh, curve cuts. My friend Angela Glover Blackwell talks about this a lot. Curve cuts uh, was for people largely in wheelchairs. But if you have a roller bag and you catch a plane or if you have a baby stroller, use curb cuts. If you have a scooter, use curb cuts. So oftentimes when you change the structure for the most marginal, it also benefits everybody else uh, along the way. This next question is around white supremacy. And I've been thinking, thinking back, enslaved Africans who were forced to the British colonies in 1619, meaning that this year actually marks the 400th year since enslaved people were forced to the United States. And this act has fundamentally shaped this country in a multitude of ways. And I know I've heard you previously speak to Toni Morrison's work where she poses the question around what has slavery done to white people? And so I want to broach this question around whiteness supremacy and separation when it comes to whiteness as an ideology. And I'm simultaneously thinking about the invisibility, the privilege, um, and torment of whiteness. You know, I think of privilege in the benefits white people reap in our racial system, invisibility in its assumed status as the norm, and uh, torment in the inherent perversion that comes from benefiting from a system of dehumanization. And so I know this is a huge question, but I'm hoping to ask you to speak to the necessity of a different sense of understanding of whiteness and how that is a part of liberating us from ideologies of dominance and hierarchy. No, that's a great question. A couple of things. Uh, I would assert that the, a lot of the ideology of dominance comes from anxiety and fear. Mm -hmm. And so part of this to think about what is the underlying anxiety and fear and I would say whiteness as an ideology has all these apparent benefits, but it actually has all of these problems associated with it as well. Uh, if you think of a small we, like the ethnic nationals do today, and it's, it's not all just around whiteness, sometimes it's around Hinduism in India or around you know, religion or, or, or uh, the way people talk. So whiteness is the expression that takes the dominant form in the United States and with, uh, with organizing around race and some other uh, important axis, but they can take on any axis. That's one of the things that's important. But when you have an axis where you have a small we, and associated with that oftentimes is this claim that the we is pure. Now think about that. If you're in a world where you need purity, you're in a constant state of anxiety. You need to wear a face mask, you probably need to never go outside. You're not, you don't, it's not a good life. In a sense, whiteness sort of wrapped itself up in this idea of uh, purity, of innocence, in a world that's very messy. Uh, and so what do you do in a world that's messy when you need order, when you need a particular order? You move to dominance. But the world never quite behaves and people never quite behave, which means your anxiety about the world being out of control is even more anxious. Uh, and it was recently a study on anxiety and uh, it found America, the industrially advanced countries, was one of the most anxious, unhappy countries on earth. So we all know about now the, the stuff about what the, the increase in white suicide. 
So a friend of mine, David Rodiger, wrote a book called Wages of Whiteness, playing off of W.B. Du Bois. And I, I've been saying to David, he needs to write a new book called The Declining Wages of Whiteness, because the benefits associated with whiteness uh, is actually, I think, in fairly steep decline, and it should be. But the, uh, the, the burden is ascending, and the benefit is declining. And, we actually, and it shows up in some ways uh, in terms of white anxiety. It's like, yes, the world of white dominance is slipping away. It should slip away. Not slip away. We should send it out in a, in a, with a big party. But here's the thing. What will take its place? And, and I would say white culture uh, in the United States and England, but even more, doesn't have much experience. England has more experience having lost its colonies of what it means to be white and not dominate, what it means to be white and be a, a co-partner with the rest of the earth. Whiteness has not meant that. And so part of it is that, can we have a new expression, a new story where no group is dominating? Because this is not trading one group for the other. We're not saying whites step back and now people of color are gonna dominate. We're not saying men step back now, women are gonna dominate. We're saying, can we actually imagine a society, a world where we're not dominating? not dominating each other, we're not dominating nature, uh, we're trying to dominate nature, and the jury's out. But we've had some positive experiences. The EU was an effort in that way. Someone said the EU could be thought of, of nations who've given up the idea of uh, global domination. Okay, for well, hundreds of years, English and French and Spanish all sort of went around the world trying to figure out who the world belonged to among the three of them, right? As opposed to belong to all the people who live on, live on it. Uh, and they had, they had very success, and they had the most success. But that success, if you want to call it, that is over. And so um, the role of the elite is an important discussion because white supremacy or uh, white privilege has always actually been a misnomer in some respects. It's only, you could say, a privilege and supreme in relationship to people of color. And that may sound obvious, but it, it's not uh, privilege and supremacy in relationship to the elites. In fact, pretty clear the elites consider themselves better than what is called the middle stratum. So what we actually call white people are the middle stratum. And that stratum is being squeezed and should be squeezed. That stratum has been reluctant to identify and work with the people at the very bottom and has aspired to be part of the top. Uh, so that's the thing we also have to break, that aspiration. It's like, no, you know, we got to actually challenge the top itself and we have to build a society which all people belong without people being dominated. Now, the good news is a number of whites indicate in some social science research, that's where they're leaning. But we don't have a story, we don't have a practice. The numbers are probably around 35, 40%. But how do we get that, those numbers up? How do we actually institutionalize that? How do we actually make it real? So we have, a, again, a future where we all belong. I know that these conversations are more often than not uncomfortable, especially because white people are not taught to or forced to talk about race. And so there's a lot of white fragility that can come up for people. And additionally, the conversations that are happening and the narratives presented in the mainstream refuse to confront the structure and the systems that perpetuate white supremacy. So 
I'd like to ask you both the importance and necessity of being uncomfortable and then how we can contribute and create conversations that confront structural racism and the reality that we are a country that has and continues to devalue life in so many ways. Right. No, I completely agree. I would expand it though, because we need, as this uh, friend says, we need policies, we need practice, we need perception, we, we need stories. So it's not just conversations. We need all of those things happening at the same time. And they're not always sequential. It's not like, well, first I'll figure all this stuff out, then I go out there. A lot of times we're learning what we're doing. And, and yeah, there's certainly, certainly there's more to whiteness than just the anxiety. I totally agree with that. Uh, but the anxiety is, is very deep. And the ideology, we see it fraying right now. I would say that Trump is an expression of that and an expression of trying to go back to an imaginary past that, can't, that never was and never will be. So when that fails and it will fail, will it fail in such a way that it destroys the whole planet? Will, it, you know, will there be a war? Can there be a, a soft landing? I don't know. In terms of being uncomfortable, two things. There's a, a, a study uh, symbol that people use in the, where you have three concentric circles. And the inner circle is complete calm and relaxation. And the next circle, the middle circle, there's some tension, anxiety, discomfort. In the third circle, there's complete panic and anxiety. And what uh, the gist of it is, the generative circle is the middle circle. We're completely at ease, which we need at times, you know, to recharge our body, to heal. But then we need to get back out there and learn. You know, if you go to the gym and you never push yourself so that you have any discomfort, it's going to be a long process of getting in shape. So part of it is to have some tension, some discomfort, but enough that you're, again, using a sports or physical analogy, you push your body, but if you push it too much, you rip the muscles. So you want, to, you want to, in a sense, control stress. You want some tension, but you don't want it to be where the person is um, actually doing harm. So that's the, that's the balance we're trying to get. How can I say, when people say we want a safe place, I say, but not too safe. You know, you didn't come here to take a nap. Um, but also there's, there's a danger sometimes of people sort of turning on each other and thinking that, the, that to be uncomfortable, to friend, essentially break is a value in and of itself. That that's an, a, a value of being real or being, and sometimes people defend that I'm just being real, I'm just telling my story. And I say, we all have multiple stories and we have to decide which one we're going to share and, what, and why we're sharing. And so... The goal is not to make people comfortable, but the goal should not be to just to attack people either. And I oftentimes say be hard on structures and soft on people. And in terms of, you know, I, I talk a lot to people all over the country, including white people, and I almost never start with white supremacy or even white privilege. I get to that, but I don't start there. Because the way you get people into a conversation is you acknowledge their own anxieties and frustrations and suffering. Uh, so if I come and just sort of start talking to people about essentially how, what a rotten history they're part of, most of them are going to close up. And, um, and everybody is not symmetrical. There's a power imbalance, center of white pain, but everybody has pain. And the way we actually invite people into a conversation is to also acknowledge their pain without equating it to other people's pain. And so I think sometimes our Desire to have these conversations means we rush too fast to, in a sense, not recognize someone else's sacred symbol, not recognize someone else's pain, and we want them to recognize ours. And that generally doesn't go well. Thinking about, you know, your work with the Haas Institute at UC Berkeley, and it serves as a hub for organizers and policymakers and researchers to, uh, quote, identify and eliminate the barriers to an inclusive, just, and sustainable society in order to create transformative change, end quote. And I saw that one issue that the Haas Institute devotes a significant amount of energy towards is that of creating new economic structures, not just economic inclusion. And that feels like a topic that is so central to so many conversations I've had on For the Wild podcast. So I'm curious to hear you speak on how it is possible to simultaneously incorporate systematically disenfranchised communities into the economic system while also navigating this understanding that we're moving into an era where we'll see mass ecological collapse due to that same economic system 
So how do we foster economic well-being for communities, especially with the understanding that belonging is indeed impacted by economic structures, while ensuring we do not support the continuation of catastrophic capitalism? That's, well, again, another great question. Joseph Stiglitz basically said our current economic crisis is not economic, it's political. And by that he means we've made choices. Uh, there's no such thing as a free market. Uh, all markets are regulated and should be regulated. And they can be over-regulated, they, they can be under-regulated, they can be regulated badly, they can be regulated, but they can't. I mean, without regulations, we don't have money. Money is only a, uh, an agreement that comes from a regulation. Most people don't, you know, remember that, that you have money in your pocket, you have a regulated part of the regulated economy in your pocket. And the question is, how do we actually make it work for everyone? And not just ultimately everyone in the United States, but everyone in the world. Uh, by some accounts, our current aspirations in terms of use of natural resources, uh, the, the way we use natural resources in a, to, in a sustainable way requires at least 1.5 planets. We only have one. So what happens to the point pi? And that number is probably going up. And so part of it is to think about not just communities, but that's certainly important, but also think about the planet. And the fact that we have a seen number and growing number of billionaires is also problematic in the sense that uh, oftentimes that money from not just individuals, but corporations distort the whole political economy, the lobbying. You know, it's interesting when corporations were first stripped of their uh, government uh, credentials because at the early part of the United States, corporations were an extension of the government. And, um, and then in the 1830s, they started moving away from that. And one of the first Supreme Court cases that dealt with that said, okay, we're going to create this space where government and corporations are separate, but corporations will never be able to influence the political structure. That was, that was the Supreme Court saying that. And because they were saying even then, in the 1830s, we recognize that they are allowed to influence the political structure, they have unfair advantage. They have the concentration of money, a lot of which is not theirs. They live forever. They can be strategic in a different way. Uh, so you've actually structuring, it's like structuring a basketball team where one team has two players, the other has six, and they say, go play ball. So corporations are not necessarily bad in of themselves, but the way we structure them is, is extremely problematic. We, we institutionalize greed and irresponsibility and lack of accountability especially at the financial sector, especially when you look at what's, happened, what's coming out of Wall Street. So in some way, the, the credit market is even more ferocious than uh, other markets. John, this has been such an incredible conversation, and I feel like I could speak with you for hours. If there's anything that hadn't been mentioned or asked by me that you want to make sure is uh, mentioned at this time, please, um, the floor is yours. Well, I'll just say, first of all, thank you. And I thank your audience. I will add one thing. Part of the anxiety that people are experiencing is not just a larger we, but also a new we. We're becoming new beings. That may sound odd, uh, but if you look historically, who it means to be a person, what it means to be a person has con continuously changed. When change happens at a rapid rate, you oftentimes have mass hysteria because people don't change easily. Uh, and you need something to help people with the change. Sometimes it's religion, sometimes it's a story, sometimes it's a uh, practice. We're experiencing that on a global level right now. So what it means to be white, what it means to be black, what it means to be gay, what it means to be an American, all those things are going to be renegotiated. And, and it's just, Trump is trying to renegotiate them. He's saying what it means to be American is to be essentially racist, is to be xenophobic, is to be um, sexist. That's what being American means. Some people buy into that. We need a, not only an alternative vision, I would say again, 15, 20 years from now, if people can reflect back, people will be different than they are now. Not just individually, but, but, uh, but groups and our relationships will be different. Um, that's both scary, but it's also an incredible opportunity. So I think uh, when I talk to my students about how do you become a bridge to this future, because the alternative future where we break from each other, where we deny our interconnectedness, where we deny our relationship with each other and with the planet means that uh, we may not have a future. It's 
Thank you for listening to another episode of For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayana Young. The music you heard today was from Ani DeFranco. I'd like to thank our podcast team, our podcast audio producer, Andrew Storrs, our media researcher and writer, Francesca Glassbell, social media coordinator, Aaron Wise, Hannah Wilton, who is our guest coordinator, and Carter Lou McElroy, our music coordinator. Drifting on the wind Through the mountains like a river